some sort of a level because I didn't want to work any harder. I developed, I had the position. I was like, well, maybe this, I didn't even think about the word potential anymore. So that's not the way to do it. That's not the way to do it. So the next time somebody says to you, hey, you've got a lot of potential, you have a responsibility to ask them the follow-up question. Well, what does that potential mean to you? And what are some of the things that I can be doing right now, right now, to get closer to realizing that, that full potential? Because, guys, this isn't a dress rehearsal. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is the show. You're in the show. And I never, in any of my classes, nor will I say it today, will I utter the words to you when you get to the real world, right? Has anybody had a teacher or anybody ever say that to them, right? <clears throat> You're in the real world now. You have, well, maybe you have car payments, maybe you have a job, maybe you have relationship issues, um, you have to deal with your parents, all of it. It doesn't get any more real than that. Right? The only thing that's going to change in your life is you're going to be adding more zeros and commas and maybe some additional responsibilities, but you, the world you're in is as real as it's going to get. Right? You're going to make it more complicated. Right? You're going to get jobs. You're going to uh, acquire debt. You're going to enter into long-term relationships. Those are the things, but it doesn't get any more real than it is now. So you'll never hear in any of my classes, well, in the real world, next time somebody says that to you, can you help me, can you explain to me the artificial nature of the world that I'm living in today, right? Because I will not let anybody who comes in my, into any of my classrooms to talk say that because they're insulting me, right? They're, they're insulting me when they say that. They don't know it, which is a whole nother story, Right? They're not thoughtful about their words, but you're in the real world and this is not a dress rehearsal. So I go to Niagara University and um, I start studying. You know, I had to do some gen ed stuff and I start studying. They started putting us into uh, classes that uh, you know, immediately got you uh, a little bit deeper into your uh, major. So I had this great instructor. He was uh, he was the general manager of the uh, Hilton in Niagara Falls, and he I was I, I always wanted to tell the story and say he pulled me aside, but I think I was just like one of the last ones leaving the class that day because I was like you guys in the back. I was a back row sitter, you know? I was a back row sitter, a little bit too cool for school, and not that you guys are that, but I was a back row sitter in just about every class I ever uh, was in. And he pulled me aside, he said, you know, Frank, you do show a little uh, adept for, for this. You're engaged in class. You, you seem to do your homework, all of those things. He said, but let me ask you, have you ever worked in a hotel? And I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, here's what you need to do. You need to work in a hotel this summer. You need to go and work in one because you'll know very quickly, just like you did with food and beverage, whether or not this is something you want to continue to do. And he said, you know, I, I can share things with you, but until you you get some of this practical experience and decide if this is what you So I took his advice. So that summer I went back home, I went back into Manhattan, and I got a job in a hotel there. It was a place called the Mayflower Hotel, right? It was on Central Park South, so if you're at all, for Central Park West. So if you're all familiar with New York, that's a great neighborhood. It was this beautiful boutique hotel. It's not there anymore. Um, and I got a job working at the front desk. I don't even know what I was making. I think I was making like 210 or something like that an hour. But that wasn't important. I had just gotten the job. And literally within the first week, I realized, anybody here ever worked at a front desk of a hotel? Yeah, okay, a bunch of you. So, right, you get, you're behind the desk, which 
can feel like a stage, right? You've got the overhead lights shining down on you, and this desk creates this little barrier of authority. Um, and all of a sudden, people were coming up to me, and besides the check in, check out, you know, we didn't have, you know, it wasn't a computerized operation, nor was there. Um, the, so people would come up to you and ask you directions, ask you for recommendations, ask you to make change. And, and this hotel seemed to be a favorite of people that were super recognizable, right? Celebrities, sports figures. And here I was, and they were coming up to me, guys like, you know, Robert De Niro coming up and saying, hey, can you break a 20 for me? Or, hey, do you know of a good pizza place around the corner? Or Martin Scorsese, the producer, he lived there that summer, director. He lived there. Roberto Duran, I'm dating myself a little bit, but people who were very recognizable but needed my help in order to get through their day, right? And I was like, I love this. This is awesome. This is the shit, and this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, my rest of my working career, because I felt needed, and I was struck immediately with what I call the nobility of service work, right? Because there are some of us who just can't see themselves serving others, right? Either we have an inflated sense of self, or maybe we're just too proud, I can't. But once you're able to tap into that nobility piece, that, you know what, I'm doing something beyond um, just, you know, doing my job. Um, once you find that in whatever it is you do, if you stay with hospitality or you move on to computer science, I don't know. But once you find the nobility in the work, and it'll come to you or it won't, right? It's not something I can teach you. All I can tell you is my experience that I was struck with it real early in my career. And so the idea of, of helping people, serving people, getting them checked in, getting them checked out, making sure things were going well with their individual stays came quickly to me once I started doing it. So I went back to school, I shared my experience with that same instructor. Then the following summer, I worked at another hotel and I did that all through school. I worked in different departments. I worked in a reservations department. I did some housekeeping. You know, I really got a feeling for the business. <clears throat> and so when I got out of school, right, when I got out of school, guys, I was exhausted. Four tough years at Niagara University studying hotel management. I was exhausted. I needed some time off, right? Uh, so, uh, let me just ask you this. Who here is not getting enough sleep? Really? Really? Okay. I got plenty of sleep when I was in school. I don't know why, but I slept a lot. I got a lot of sleep. But yet, I was still tired. So, what I'm getting to is that I took a couple of months off. I didn't do much of anything. I went to the beach, hung out with friends. So after a couple of months of that, my dad, I was living in Brooklyn, they were living in Chicago, and uh, he said, hey, jackass, when are, you, when are we gonna do something here? When are we gonna get off the, uh, you know, get off the starting line? And I was living off graduation gifts, and um, my grandmother had moved and left me her apartment for six months rent-free. So I was getting by. So the way we got a job then, if you were really starting your career, there weren't job sites, there weren't um, you know, places online to get a job. So what you did was you printed your resume, you made like 300 copies of your resume, another 200 copies of a standard cover letter, cover letter and then uh, you had a couple of different situational cover letters. And what I did was I did a direct mailing, right? I identified every general manager of every hotel in New York, in the city, that I wanted to work at, and I sent out a mailing, basically, right? 
And lo and behold, I got a phone call. I get a phone call from the general manager of the San Moritz Hotel in New York, which was on Central Park South. Uh, at the time, it was owned by a lady by the name of Leona Helmsley. So she was the queen of the hotel industry in the 80s, early 80s. And um, I had a job as a sales manager, a corporate sales manager for her New York hotels. Um, I had no sales experience. Uh, and, um, you know, I showed up for work and I had this amazing office looking over Central Park, right? And I shared it with another gentleman who was probably, I was 21, and Mickey, Mickey Chong, um, Chinese fellow, was probably in his late 40s, early 50s, chain smoker, right? And that was when you could smoke in the offices, which, like, everybody did. Um, not quite madman style, madman style, but there was a lot of that. And, um, I didn't know anything about what I was supposed to do. As a matter of fact, my first job uh, duty, so they gave me a corporate rate to sell of $91. Imagine staying at a five-star hotel in New York for $91. Um, and they gave me a bunch of sign-up sheets and they sent me down the street to the GM Tower, right? So for those of you who have seen New York, the Apple store, the one that's all in glass, the building behind it is the old GM building, right? So they said, just get in the elevator.